I want to, uh, <clears throat> I, I always read this passage. It's not on the screen, but I always read this um, before I preach. This Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. This is a reminder to myself. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent it. So no matter um, today what I say, the words you're going to see on the screen from, from, from God's word, that's what I pray that you hear. If you don't hear anything I say today, because I promise I'll probably word something a little differently than I'd planned, um, but, but I, I hope that you hear God's word today and, and that God's word um, changes you today. Um, the first passage that, that I want to uh, look at, uh, I want you to keep this in mind as, as we go through uh, our, our, our message this morning. And it's Mark, it's chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So please keep that in your mind. We've already heard that once this morning. But keep that in your mind as we go out through this message uh, of, of, of Jesus' example. Now, now, there's a constant battle going on in, in our lives. Um, some of us may admit it freely and openly. Um, others, may, we may try to hide it. Um, but there, there's a battle between our wants and our needs and, and our desires against what God's will for our lives is. In our worldview, it's okay um, if you have a job that doesn't satisfy you, it's okay to, to quit. Um, it's okay to leave college, and it's not for my daughter out here. Uh, it's okay to leave college in our world if you, if you want to go find yourself. That, 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 that's okay. Um, in our worldview uh, and how the world sees things, um, our personal desires, that, that's what gets priority. Uh, and sometimes that's even at the cost of relationships and, and financial security and responsibilities. We fight for our rights. Sometimes we abandon our faith, or, or worse, we'll even distort our, our faith so, we, the, can, so that we can feel free to, to sin or, or leave how we want. Um, we look for the loophole. We may shade the truth. We manipulate the system if and when it benefits us. Now, I want to share a scene from, a, 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 from the movie Princess Diaries. Um, now, for the guys, I didn't say the Princess Bride. I, I'm not going to quote any Princess Bride quotes. Uh, but but, but uh, the, the Princess Diaries, it's, it's a movie that many of the girls in here um, grew up loving. I know my daughter Megan loved it, and uh, I kind of liked it too. So, but anyways. Um, in the movie Princess Diary, there, there's a, the, the character, it's young, she's Mia Thermopolis. And she finds out that she's heir to the throne of Genovia. Now the scene I'm going to share, it's a scene in which Mia delivers a speech about her decision whether or not to accept the role as princess of Genovia and what this decision would, would mean for her life. And this is the scene, this is what Mia says. She says, I wonder how I'd feel after abdicating my role as princess of Genovia. Would I feel relieved or would I feel sad? And then I realized how many stupid times a day I use the word I. In fact, probably all I ever do is think about myself. And how lame is that when there are seven billion people on this planet? But then I thought, if I cared about the other seven billion people out there instead of just me, there's probably much better use of my time. You see, if I were princess of Genovia, then my thoughts and the thoughts of people smarter than me would be much better heard, and just maybe those thoughts could be turned into action. So think about ourselves. How often do, do we use the word I in our lives? How often do we, do we focus on ourselves? How often do we, do we work to get what we want? Jesus said, I came to give my life. I came and laid down my rights, my privileges, to ransom all of you, every single one. See, there's a huge difference between Jesus' Jesus's priorities and the priorities of this world. 
So I want to ask you all a question, and don't answer out loud. But I want you to think about this question. Is there a noticeable difference between your personal priorities and the ones we read with the world? Or is there a noticeable difference between what Jesus' priorities are and what your priorities are? Now remember the passage that we started out with. I'm going to keep going back to that. Keep this in your mind. And it was Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. That's, that's what Jesus did for us. Now I'm going to give you another little illustration out of another, uh, another movie, uh, the Charlotte's Web. Um, Charlotte's Web, it's, it's a children's movie, and it's based on, on the spider named Charlotte who lives in a barn just above the stall of a pig named Wilbur. Wilbur is worried that once he grows fat enough, the farmer is going to take him and turn him into bacon. Can you smell bacon? It smells good. But anyway, Charlotte and Wilbur, they develop a close, close friendship. And it, as Wilbur grows larger, Charlotte uses all of her resources to try to rescue Wilbur. She writes messages on her web to convince the farm's owner that Wilbur is a pig worth saving. The story builds to the final chapter titled, The Moment of Triumph. So, so what was Charlotte's moment of triumph? As the story draws to a close, Charlotte the spider is in the barn dying. Wilbur the pig is being judged at the county fair in a pig contest. And Charlotte can hear the roar of applause for Wilbur as he wins a special prize and his life is spared. Charlotte finds great joy in knowing that her life has meant the success of another. Her close friend Wilbur was spared. Even though no one remembered her, and what she had done, and the sacrifices she had made, she is satisfied in knowing that having loved a friend in life and in death meant something. Now, now back to you and I. Um, at the end of our lives, what are we going to think about ourselves and how we lived? What will other people say about how we lived our lives? You see, when we become Christians, we're called to take on the, Christ, the cross of Christ and, and carry that. So at the end, will we be able to say, or will others be able to say, that we carried that cross? Now we're continuing in our series that it taught is titled, um, The King's Example. And, and today we're, we're, we see ourselves, and we're in chapter 10, and, and it lays out the battle we've been talking about. The battle between our priorities our desires and our wants against what Jesus' will for our life is. Again, remember, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. So as, as, I look, as we look through this text today, I, I want you to keep that in mind. But I, I want you to look, allow the text to look inside your souls here and to reveal where our priorities are. And, and, and I pray, Lord, that we submit to wherever the Spirit uh, leads us to do so. So we're going to begin our passage today. Um, again, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. And I'm going to begin by reading verses 2 through 5. And, the, and Pharisees came up, in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment. So, so the first point that I think we can get from our passage is how we, we can elevate our desires over God's will. Now, in, in the section we just read, you know, the, the Pharisees, they're, they're really trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to trip him up. But, but the Israelites, they'd already made their decision on divorce, and they knew what the law said. But we need to see that Jesus knows within this question there's an actual problem that, that's being revealed. And that problem is men are putting their own desires before God's will. Jesus said the allowance was for divorce was made because of hard hearts. Let's continue in our passage and we read verses 6 through 9. But from the beginning of creation God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. God's will is for marriage to be lifelong, that man and, and woman would be inseparable. But we're all human. And we know that all of us, in one way or another, we've let desires and situations move us away from God's will. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we read this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, birth to sin. And, when sin, and sin, when it fully grows, brings forth death. But here's the thing, when we fall short, whatever way it may be, when we fall short, we don't need to stay there. We need to get back up and move forward and returning and seeking to God's will for our life. And we found an example that, that helps us here in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And this is a powerful truth that helps us move back to God's will for our lives. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6 reads... For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to, the mind on, to, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Now let's get back into our, our text today, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. This is another situation in, in our text. It reads, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked him. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a small child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, now, the next point that I believe our passage it, it reveals is that we can elevate the practical over the compassion. In, in our passage, the disciples here, they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're helping Jesus here by, by keeping the kids away. He, he has a lot on his mind. And we know that as we go through the study of Mark, Jesus is he's on the road to the cross. They didn't want to bother him. But, but Jesus, he recognized what was important. Now for us, how, how easy is, is it for us to fall in that same trap where, where the practical decisions, they keep us from reaching out with compassion to those around us who need it. I know we all think that we have too much to do. Um, I work hard and I need rest. I don't want the hassle. I don't want to get in that mess. But we're called to. As Christians, we're, we're called to. Now, I, I've shared this illustration before, but um, it, it fits well in this passage. Um, while preparing a sermon, Kevin Miller posed this question to his friends on Facebook. And he asked them, what makes it hard for you to serve other people? They gave great answers, including, serving is hard when it doesn't fit in my schedule or plan. Like when I want to go for a walk or take a long bath, but my aging parent needs me to sort through the medications, run an errand, or simply be with them. Another person wrote, It's hard when their needs seem endless. I don't want to risk helping and serving others because I may get sucked in. Being swallowed up in the serving and not getting to be the me that I think I am or should be. Another wrote, there, There's... Such limited energy left after a demanding work day. Meeting our basic responsibilities, whether young kids or, or, or living in the corporate world, how do you balance the need for rest and self-care with serving others? But out all the answers we got, Kevin Miller shared this was his favorite, favorite answer. He said, what makes it hard serving others? Others. People are messy, you know? It, it, it can get us in places we don't want to be. But, but see, you, you and I, um, you, you may not feel that way, but if I'm truthful, my circumstances may not be like the ones we just, we just read. Um, but when it comes down to it, I often put my needs in front of the other's needs. I consider my wants and my desires first 
before I do anything. Now in our passage, again, we know that Jesus, he's on the way to the cross. But when Jesus sees this behavior keeping the kids from him, our text words uses the word indignant. That's how, that's how upset Jesus was over it. The disciples, they, they thought they were doing good. They were looking at the practical. But, but Jesus is teaching them and us for the same extent that, that, that these little ones were important. And, he, and these little ones provide us an example of the faith that we should all have. Now, I'm going to be honest here. I get myself in trouble. They tell you in, in Bible college not to give so many examples of yourself, but I don't listen well, and I, I can't help it. But I'm going to share just a, a brief little story about um, me. Um, as most of you know, uh, for four or five years, uh, I was going to Bible college, and then I work at the golf course, and, and then I help some here. Um, my life was very busy. Um, and to be honest, Julie, Megan, and Patrick, they, they didn't get the best of me at times. Um, but last year something happened that kind of called me out on it a little bit and, and, uh, and it helped me, but it ties into the message here today. Um, Patrick's ball coaches knew that I was in ministry and uh, they asked him a question, a biblical question, and he didn't know the answer to it. And, and so they, they told him, they said, well, ask your dad. A few days had passed and um, they asked him again. And here's what... Here's what he told them. He said, I wanted to ask him, but he's always busy working on papers, so I didn't want to bother him. Um, when the coaches later shared that with me, it broke my heart. Um, and, I, and I thought, how many other times had I let the practical? I had assignments. I, I had projects around home. I had work, but I also had TV and naps. But how often did I let the practical keep me from, from being there for, for Julie and, and Megan and Patrick when they may have needed me? I elevated the practical over the compassionate. Now, I know we're all busy. Um, everybody is busy now. Um, but as, as children, as students, as adults, whatever stage of life we're in, I know there are things that we need to do but we can't let the practical get in the way of us reflecting Jesus to, to the world around us and being there when people need us. Let's continue in our passage. We're going to read Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And he was, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The next point I want to discuss in our passage is, is that we can elevate security over salvation. Now to be honest, it's kind of hard not to feel sorry for this man. He seems to be doing everything that, that the law required. But there's something that gets in his way. He can't give up his security blanket, which for him was his possessions. Now, now money is, is a great tool, and it's been given to us by God so that we can accomplish his worst. His, but, but, but money can be a terrible, terrible master. I like how uh, the NLT translation of 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 and 18 read. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They shall be rich in good works and generous to those in need always being ready to share with others. So, so we can't trust money, 
but we can use it. And God expects, expects us to be conduits for the money. Uh, we're not to receive it and to, and to store it up just for our enjoyment. Some of it we can, but we also need to be mindful and use them for the kingdom. Jesus here, he offers a salvation that, that's not worldly security. He offers a relationship with him, a transaction with him. And we know, or we should know, that there's no more safer or more secure place than to be living in his will. Now we're going to continue our passage here, and we're going to read a bigger, a bigger section here. And we're going to be Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for, for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which I am to be baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who him has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they, became, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must also be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the last point I, I want to look at in, in our passage is that we can, we, can, we can lift up being exalted over being humbled. What do James and John want here? They, they, they want places of honor. They want to be exalted for the sacrifice and the support that they had given. Now what happened when the others heard it? They were mad at James and John. And they're probably mad at James and John because they might have been thinking, hey... I deserve that. I need the place of honor, not them. But Jesus here, he explains to them that, that being exalted isn't the goal. Serving others is the goal. If you want to be great, you bow down and serve. Now, I love how the Holy Spirit works. Um, Larry's communion meditation today just ties, it ties right in. Um, because in John's Gospel... As Larry shared, we, we, we're in a scene and Jesus gives a first-hand illustration of what He means here. Jesus had just washed the feet of the apostles. And then we read what happens after He does this. We're reading John chapter 13, verses 12 through 15. When He had washed their feet and put on His outer garments and resumed His place, He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you, should also, you should also should do just as I have done to you. Now, now in our passage, James and John, they're looking for a place of honor. You know, if I'm honest... I'm a people pleaser. I, I like to be thanked. I like to be recognized sometimes for, for things that I do. But Jesus, in the passage that we had, and in the passage Larry shared and, and we just read, um, he gives us an example to follow. In order to be exalted in the kingdom, we must put the needs of others first and follow the king's example. Now, now, as we start discussing today, in our lives, we are in a battle for our souls. Our desires are God's will. My wants 
or, or the needs of others. We're all getting ready to get up and sing a song and walk out these doors. But before you do, I'd like you to keep these questions on your mind. And again, I would, I would, I would encourage you to let the Holy Spirit uh, work through you in these. What's more important to you? Seeking to live your will or God's will? What's more important? Being practical? Being busy and practical? Or being compassionate? Stopping when others need your help? What's more important? Your, your, your 401k, your job and your finances, or your eternal salvation? And also the salvation of those you can influence as a Christ follower. And are you looking to be exalted? Um, are you willing to humble yourself as, as Jesus Christ did and follow his example? Now, if you're like me, um, sadly, my answers, they're not what they should be. But, but we all have a choice. Um, when we can walk out these doors, we, we, can, we can change. Um, and, and I pray, as I started out, I pray that, that, that you have heard God's Word read today and, and that God's Word will change and, and will we'll move you in the direction that, that we need to be in order to call ourselves Christ followers and reflect Christ to the world who needs Him.